Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this morning, this evening, as we come to you, uh, by way of your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us, opening our hearts and our minds to the truth which your word contains. Father, we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message this morning is based in our Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 26. I'll read uh, verses 16 and 17. This day, the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules and will obey his voice. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the nation of Israel who had just finished their 40-year journey throughout the wilderness. And now they stand on the precipice of the promised land, of the land flowing with milk and honey. However, we need to begin our message by unpacking why such a jaunt through the wilderness was necessary in the first place for God's people. This was because those 40 years were a judgment upon them for their sins against God and their mistrust and their doubt of God's power and his mercy towards them. The 40 years was a lesson in humility for a people that refused to listen to or trust in both God's power and God's mercy. God had rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, ripping them from the hands of of the most powerful ruler and the most powerful nation the world had ever known. And God did this himself. Without the help of an army, without the help of fellow man, he did this with his own word, with his own power. He did this with a show of power that was unequaled throughout and in mankind. This demonstrated that absolutely nothing in the world could stand against God ever. If God willed it, nobody could stop it. In doing this, he brought plagues upon the Egyptian people because their leader, the Pharaoh, the great Pharaoh, thought that he had the might and the power of a God. He considered himself a God. The Israelites then were witnesses to the strength and the glory of God both in the ten plagues and in the miracle of God parting the Red Sea and then closing that sea after the Israelites had gone through in order to destroy Pharaoh and his army who had been chasing his own people. This was no accident. This was not a natural phenomenon. This was the hand of God delivering his people. Now you would think that such a physical manifestation of God's power would be enough that the Israelites would then trust in God's promises and surely in his ability to fulfill those promises. All they had seen, all they had witnessed. You think that would be enough to convince them. In fact, we say, boy, if we could see God's power, wouldn't we believe in him just a little bit more? Why doesn't God do more miracles today? So when they get to the promised land for the first time, and God tells them not to worry, that he will go before them, that he will conquer the people, he will push them out because God is giving the people their promised land. You'd think their re reaction would be, okay, God, we trust you. We've seen what you're capable of doing. We'll listen. That's not their reaction, is it? They chose to test the Lord Almighty, and they told Moses that they should send out spies so that they could see the land for themselves, so that they could be the judges of how difficult or how good this land really was. This is plain and simple, not trusting in God. Moses, thinking there was nothing wrong with their request, goes along and he sends 12 spies, one from each tribe, in order to go and to take a look 
to survey the land. And then they come back and simply report what they saw. How often do we lose sight of God altogether when we stop trusting in Him and His promises for us? The Israelites witnessed firsthand what God could do. They witnessed firsthand that He was a God of His promises to save and deliver them. And yet, their reaction is to forget. Their reaction is to not trust. So when the spies come back and report that, yes, there is an abundance of food and resources, it's a beautiful looking land, but there's a small problem with that. There's other people that think it's just as fertile. In fact, they're big, and there's many of them. We can't do this. We aren't a mighty army. We can't take on these people. When we wait to do something that we believe God is calling us to do before we can totally wrap our minds around it, this is much in the same thing. If God calls us to do something, but we say, wait, God, let me, let me get a feel for this first. I need to know if I really can do this before I set out. We doubt. We don't trust in God any longer. So fast forward 40 years to the second time now in our reading that God's people are overlooking this promised land. These aren't the Israelites that mistrusted God. These were their children. These were the ones that were left in the desert. And they're looking at this place, the place that God had promised to Abraham and to their forefathers, and now this is a reality. They can see it. There's nothing that's going to stand in their way of them taking God's land. Moses had passed authority over to Joshua, and life is certainly going to get better because after all, they're no longer in the desert. They no longer have to eat that dreaded manna over and over and over again. Of not having a home or a land, these ideas are finally behind them. They will finally get a place to call their own where they could put in their roots and establish themselves amongst the rest of the nations. They are what you would say at the light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes we're tempted into thinking that God is helping us to reach a destination as the Israelites did tonight. And once God helps us get to where we need to be, once God helps us erect the building or the church, we can sit back, relax, and enjoy the fruits of our sacrifice. Our hard work is over. Our day is done. But life with God is just that. It's life with God living it in the shadow of the cross. Jesus calls us to pick up our crosses and to follow him. In the Great Commission, if we look at the Greek text, it reads, In your going, I command you to teach and to baptize, assuming that we will be going when we're in the world. Our rest is not found on the couch in front of the TV binge-watching Netflix at night. This is not where our rest comes from. Rest is found Sunday mornings or whenever you gather around the Word of God to receive God's gift of forgiveness from sins, to receive the assurance of this forgiveness through baptism and through the Lord's Supper. Jesus Jesus is where we find our rest. Life with God, it's not a destination. It's a journey. The promised land and the temple that will be built upon it and then destroyed, not just once, but twice. These are but shadows of the true home of God and the eternal kingdom. Our 40-day journey with Jesus, what we call the Lenten season, this journey with Jesus to the cross and to the tomb leads us into Jesus' ascension and then to the time of the church and the Great Commission. This leads us then to Advent and the coming of Christ and his glory and our preparation through, the, through God's means of grace. This then leads us to Epiphany 
and the message of salvation for all people, which then leads us to Lent, which then leads us, which leads us. It's cyclical. It's not a destination. It's a process. Lent, Advent, Epiphany, all of these are meant to keep us going throughout our day, throughout our week, throughout our years. We are to dwell with God wherever that might lead. Rather than to think God's going to lead us to a spot and simply be okay, rather we are called to trust God in all things. You get the idea. Our journey with God and our dependence on Him will only end in the fulfillment of scriptures at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But until then, let us look to God in the world. Let us look to God in the scriptures through the lenses of faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit alone. Let us recognize our sin. Let us recognize our need for God, for the promise of the Father who declares that all that come to him by the very body and blood of Jesus Christ will be cleansed and redeemed and be called holy ones of God. And in honoring and fulfilling then God's word, we will dwell with him both now and forever. I want to end this message by reading now the words that follow are in our reading. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people for his treasured possession, as he has promised you, and that you are to keep all his commandments, and that he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor, high above all nations that he has made, and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. As God's children, we live, we dwell, we walk, we serve, and we love in the promise of God, in the presence of God, who will be there with us always. Amen. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, this evening as we come to you in this uh, Lenten Wednesday evening, Father, we ask that you would help us as we journey with you. Help us, Father. We need homes. We need places to go. But, Father, we need to trust in you above all things, that you are a God of your promise, a fulfilled promise in Jesus Christ on the cross, where he took our sins, where he declared us to be righteous. Father, we ask that you would continue to help us to walk with you, to dwell with you, to trust in your promise and in your ways. Father, we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.